pulling the city out of a major homelessness partnership with Multnomah County. And that was huge news to the Multnomah County chairperson. So, so I learned it from the Oregonian. The Beachy Creek Fire in the Santiam Canyon turned into one of Oregon's most destructive ever. It's also been burning since August. And a viewer wants to know why it was allowed to. And another viewer wants to know, do you need a permit to protest? The answer is no. Well, you know, unless you do. Simple enough. Here's the story. I'll elaborate. Hey, if you are new to the, to the story, to the show here, uh, this is how you play along from home, as you can probably tell from the open there. You ask questions, you leave comments, and we answer and address them. If they're really good ones, we'll do it right here on the show. You'll see that tonight. Send us your emails to the story at kgw.com. You can find me on Facebook at Dan Haggerty KGW or use Twitter in the hashtag HeyDan. I'm Dan Haggerty. I've said my name three times in three sentences. It's also written behind me. I'm not insecure, I promise. I'm a little insecure. And this is the story. Let's get started. And we're going to jump right into the big story tonight, which brings us back to our homelessness crisis right in the forefront, as it, as it really always has been. It's about a comment from Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler during an interview with the editorial board of the Oregonian. The mayor said the city and county together haven't done enough to get houseless people off the streets and into shelters. And if that doesn't change, the mayor says Portland's partnership with Multnomah County is over. Maggie Vespa takes it from here. Safe, stable housing is critical to maintaining the public's health. Mayor Ted Wheeler threatened this week to pull the city of Portland and its tens of millions of dollars in funding out of the Joint Office of Homeless Services, an office the city currently runs with Multnomah County. The threat came during an endorsement interview with the Oregonians' editorial board Monday. Wheeler is up for re-election in November against opponent Sarah Ayanna Rome. In Monday's interview, the mayor said he wants to zero in on housing the chronically homeless, those seen living on the streets downtown. As part of that focus, he said he wants to open 300 new shelter beds in Portland by November. If county leaders can't or won't follow suit, he told the paper the city of Portland will go its own direction. Basically, he's arguing the joint office needs to be more aggressive in getting people out of tents around the city and into safer shelters. Multnomah County Chair Deborah Cafori called the mayor's threat outrageous. When did you learn that Mayor Wheeler was considering pulling the city of Portland out of the partnership that is the Joint Office of Homeless Services? Um, I learned that the mayor had said in his Oregonian Oregonian interview yesterday that he was considering pulling out of the joint office. So I learned it from the Oregonian. Here's some background. The city and county formed the joint office in 2016 as a way to streamline the work and funding. Both were already pouring into housing. The joint office's 2021 budget is $75.2 million. The city and county are each footing just over $32 million of that. While much of that money goes toward providing affordable housing for families, veterans, and other groups, the joint office currently provides 1,400 beds in homeless shelters year-round. Officials estimate just over 2,000 people are sleeping on the streets in Multnomah County, and they believe that number is rising thanks to job losses during the pandemic. And I think that's the thing that's so frustrating for me in this is knowing that every, on any given night, 12,000 people are in a home because of the work that we've done. And that any talk of dismantling the joint office is going to scare folks and people will fear for their lives. Mayor Ted Wheeler has often trumpeted the joint office's success. The push for 300 beds started about a month ago when he promised to help businesses struggling in downtown. Whether it's helping support businesses that have had uninsured losses, whether it's sharing the cost of helping to clean the graffiti. In a statement Wednesday, the mayor's comments about the joint office were softer, writing, I am prepared for an honest and transparent conversation about where we are collectively succeeding and where we aren't. Chair Kafori says officials were already working to open hundreds more shelter beds. About the mayor's threat, she added, That's not a campaign strategy that I think is going to work. And speaking of, the mayor's opponent, Sarah Ayanna Rohn, sent us a statement. It reads, in part, I stand with Chair Kafori and the thousands of houseless individuals who benefit from the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Houselessness impacts all of us, and this is no time for political games.
Okay, Maggie Vespa joining us now. So part of this to me sounds a lot just like politics, but if I were one of the thousands of people relying on some of these, uh, some of the things that are provided through this partnership, I'd be very concerned that they could be going away. So is that concern valid right now? So at this point, I guess it's fair to say there's no definitive answer to that. The mayor said what he said. Um, that said, Chair Kafori told us she does not see the city backing out of the Joint Office of Homeless Services. She does not think this is going to happen. And one reason for that is that hundreds, those hundreds of beds were already, she said, in the pipeline to be opened. They just hadn't made a public announcement about it. Um, and she told me that she does think that that could happen by November. All that said again, if the city does back out of the Joint Office of Homeless Services, no one we talked to today knows basically how that would work, how these functions would work moving forward, which mm. agency or which governing body would take which shelters or which services. There's just no plan for that at this point. So that's kind of where we are. But if it helps alleviate, uh, helps alleviate people's stress, she doesn't see this happening. Okay. Uh, did, did Deborah Kafori speak to the mayor about his comments, about what he said? No. She said she had not talked to him yet. Uh, she also pointed out, and this is something that we've known covering the joint office, uh, the mayor, Mayor Ted Wheeler, has been in charge of Portland's Housing Bureau for years, meaning he's been part of the team that decides how the joint office spends its money. So she said that was kind of a big reason why she was so surprised by this public threat. And again, she said it was the first time that she had heard that because this is coming from somebody who's been part of the group that decides, again, how the joint office functions. Um, and in his statement today, I do want to point out, because that second statement came out, he says he will continue to prioritize livability and public safety. That said, he didn't want to do interviews today. So that was kind of um, what we got from him. That full statement is at KGW.com. Also worth noting, the Oregonians editorial board, and again, remember, that's the whole reason why this interview happened. They have not decided who they're endorsing in the mayoral race yet. That is due out October 4th. So we'll be watching for all of that as well. All right, Maggie Vespa, thank you. When you are houseless, everything is harder. So for four years, the city of Portland and Multnomah County have worked together under the Joint Office of Homeless Services to make things a little bit easier. And now the mayor is calling its future into question. So how did we get here? Obviously, our homeless crisis goes way back, but for the sake of the story, we're going to go back to 2005, when Portland and Multnomah County first embarked on a partnership to address homelessness. They called it the 10-year plan to end homelessness. At the time, leaders estimated there were 4,000 houseless people in Portland. So over the next 10 years, Portland spent nearly $850 million on affordable housing and homeless prevention to try and put a dent in that number. But by the end of that 10-year period, the city found there was only a slight dip. So what happened? It's not that they weren't helping anybody. In fact, the city says the program helped thousands of people find permanent homes or prevented them from becoming homeless. The problem was, for everybody they helped, there were more people becoming homeless every day. The city said Portland would have solved homelessness six times over if all households were able to retain their housing and if no new households had become homeless. So Portland reviewed all of the info before creating the Joint Office for Homeless Services in 2016. It created a financial partnership between the city and Multnomah County to make homeless services easier to access and help people who are both homeless and in danger of soon becoming homeless. But the office has gone through hundreds of millions of dollars since its creation in 2016. Besides, Mayor Wheeler says things have changed anyway. COVID has made our crisis even more extreme, and it's going to require different thinking. We'll have to wait to see what that is. In the meantime, that's how we got here. Time for today's edition of Were There Clashes Between Protesters and Police Last Night? The answer being yes. Haven't used that font yet. All right, it, it, we actually can say yes, there actually was. Police arrested three people after a group marched to the Penumbra Kelly building in southeast Portland. They're also investigating a shooting nearby that they say two people were involved in who were also involved in the marching a little bit earlier. Recently, protesters and police have been clashing a lot more, you might have noticed, after our air quality has uh, improved a lot more. Right-wing Proud Boys are planning a big march of their own 
this Saturday at Delta Park in North Portland. And even though today the Parks Department denied them a permit to gather, they're going to still go ahead and do that. Of course, since uh, there have been a lot of protests in the city without permits, we thought it was a good time to answer a question from Charlene from a few weeks ago. She asked, I thought to have a legal protest, a permit must be obtained. And the short answer there is, not really, not always. See, for the most part, the Constitution protects peaceful protests in traditional public forums. And according to the American Civil Liberties Union, that includes parks and sidewalks and, yes, streets. In general, you don't need a permit to get together and hold signs and chant and hand out pamphlets, things like that. But the freedom of assembly doesn't give people permission to break the law. We've been talking a lot about that here on the story as well, like blocking a street or an entrance to a building or harassing people. So if protesters want to march down a public street and block traffic, they should get, or at least they're supposed to have a permit to do that. The 2017 Women's March in downtown Portland is a great example of when it's working the way it's supposed to. At the time, there were about 100,000 people in the streets, and they were disrupting traffic for hours, but they got a permit, so it was all good as far as the city was concerned. It's also typically the safest way to have an event like this because everybody is on the same page. As for the Proud Boys, the city says they denied them their permit because of COVID-19 restrictions. The city actually telling us they haven't issued any protest permits for the last few months because of of those same restrictions. But again, those permits are only necessary if the protest would break laws like disrupting traffic. Yes, I guess they would also go against the governor's orders when it comes to social gatherings and things like that, but this is this is complicated stuff. Yes, we have seen plenty of protests recently where people have broken those laws, like blocking a street without a permit. But again, the First Amendment isn't something that officials take lightly or try to stifle, which is why a peaceful march of thousands isn't met with thousands of arrests. Thank you so much for the question, Charlene. Hope that clears things up. If you want some more clarity, please write us back. If you want something else answered, just email us the story at kgw.com or tweet us using the hashtag HeyDan. So we are about a month and a half from the election. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be here on the story talking about your ballot and some of the things that are on it. And there is some really important statewide Oregon measures like Measure 110, also known as the Drug Addiction Treatment and Recovery Act. This would decriminalize small amounts of drug possession. But keep in mind, it would not legalize any drugs. We want to make that clear. The measure removes criminal penalties for drug possession misdemeanors. They, you could still get a fine. All right, um, so there's, there's some details here to iron out. The idea is to get people out of the criminal justice system, though, and into drug treatment programs. That's something the measure would also do by creating new addiction recovery centers. It would use marijuana tax dollars to do this. Now, backers of the measure, like the group Drug Policy Alliance, they point to Portugal as a model. See, that country decriminalized drug possession back in 2001. Today, drug use there remains about the same, but the number of people getting treatment went up 60% in the decade after decriminalization. Overdose deaths also dropped, and so did the number of people arrested and charged with any sort of drug crime, even the more serious stuff. So today, I talked to Multnomah County's new district attorney, Mike Schmidt, about this, and based on his progressive policies, it's no surprise that he does support it. Yeah, so I'm in favor of ballot measure 110. Um, you know, I think that uh, for a long time, public safety leaders have been giving platitudes towards uh, the idea that, hey, we can't arrest our way out of addiction. A jail cell is not a, a therapeutic environment for somebody. Uh, so I think it's time to, to step up and put our, our ideas into action and say, look, if this is your first or second time uh, interaction with the criminal justice system and it's based just on possession of a small a user quantity of drugs, let's try something different. I mean, Oregon ranks somewhere around 49th in the nation in terms of our addiction issues. We also similarly rank about last in the country towards our access to treatment. Uh, so, you know, I think what we've been doing clearly has failed. Uh, and so I'm willing and I think that it's a, a smart move for somebody who on their first or second time interacting with the criminal justice system, we try treatment. Uh, that makes sense to me. I support that. Now, there is a campaign against drug decriminalization. The group No on Measure 110 registered as a political action committee just about a week ago, and this is their Facebook page. They have posts saying that Oregon needs real treatment and are concerned about kids getting their hands on hard drugs. Now, back in August, you might remember there was a bit of a controversy over this measure with the Urban League of Portland pulling their support, at least temporarily. OPB in the Willamette Week reported that the group didn't think the Drug Policy Alliance was paying enough attention to the drug problems in communities of color. We've reached out to the Urban League 
vague, but we haven't heard back from them. I'm, I'm sure we will. We'll, we'll let you know what they say. But as of now, they are not listed as an endorsement on the Yes on Measure 110 website. But other groups supporting communities of color, like the NAACP, for instance, have endorsed it. The Beachy Creek Fire has been burning since August, way before it devastated the Santiam Canyon. And the viewer wants to know why it wasn't put out sooner. Plus, your November ballot could be rejected for something as small as your signature not matching. So, how do you check what signature the state has on file? The answer, when the story continues. Hey, welcome back to the story. So we begin, uh, you know, we get tons of emails and Facebook messages every single night from a lot of you. We begin a lot of questions about elections, which is good because those are important. So keep them coming, and we're kind of nerds, so we love answering them. Email us at the story at kgw.com. You can tweet us also using the hashtag #HeyDan. Now, last night we talked about what happens if your signature on your ballot doesn't match what the election office has on file for you. They have to look identical for you, or at least close enough to where uh, experts look at them and say this is the person who's supposed to be casting this ballot for. Account. And today we got an obvious follow up question. Bob asked us on Twitter how can you check to see your ballot signature, right? The one that they have for you. See if it matches the one you're current, currently using. And the simple answer is you can't. Sorry. Uh, today, the director of Multnomah County Elections told us that those signatures aren't available for the public to access online. I'm sure it has to do with security or something like that, but you can't look it up. So if you think your signature has changed, the office recommends that you fill out a new Oregon voter registration card and mail it back to get a fresh signature on file. So different question now on a different topic. Dan emailed us and said, the Beachy Creek fire actually started in mid-August and was allowed to burn by the state. Not sure why. Dan, thank you for the question. Great name. As of today, the Beachy Creek fire has torched more than 200, or 192,000 acres, and it isn't even halfway contained as we're doing this newscast. So you're right. It was uh, for weeks the fire was really small and still burning until it wasn't really small. Uh, there's an article from September 16th in the Salem Statesman Journal that we think is really worth your time and explains why it was allowed to smolder for so long. Lightning actually started this fire on October, uh, August 16th, and firefighters initially managed to dump water on it and kind of slow things down. After that, they had other stuff to do. They had bigger fires that they had to start worrying about, and the Forest Service determined that the terrain there was actually too hazardous to attack the fire directly. So they just kind of worked to contain it. But once those powerful Labor Day winds kicked in, there was no stopping this thing from turning it into the monster that it became. The full article in the Statesman Journal goes into a lot more fascinating, fascinating detail, and we do really think it is worth your time. We've been trying to give these shout outs to our wildfire heroes. Today, we want to give a huge high five to Lindsay Farrell, who, along with her family, made a trip from North Dakota to donate supplies to people in need. Now, she may live out of state, pretty far out of state, if you ask me, but her roots are in the Santiam Canyon. My kids went to Mary Lynn. I attended Mary Lynn and lived on the North Fork when I was a kid. I knew I had to do something. And the community really gathered behind me. And before she knew it, the community had donated so much stuff. I mean, you can see it here. Families are going to get a chance to pick through some of this stuff and see what you need at Mary Lynn School in Lyons tomorrow and Friday from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. So major shout out to Lindsay Farrell. Way to go. And if you want to shout out a wildfire hero in your life, you want us to brag about them, it would be our honor. So send us a picture. Tell us a little bit about them. Send it to the story at KGW.com. Message me on Facebook or Instagram. And there's always that Twitter and the hashtag HeyDan. Individual people like Lindsay can make a huge difference in people's lives, but we can all do something to help people who are going through this really difficult time. One way is the KGW Northwest Response Fund. We've been plugging this a lot because people continue to donate. And if you head to the website, you can see there, kgw.com slash Red Cross. It'll take you where you can donate to wildfire recovery. KGW viewers have been so amazingly generous since these fires started. You've given more than I could ever imagine. Nearly $1.8 million. Let's see if we can get to $2 million. I think we can do it. Thanks so much for your generosity. All right, your comments and questions, we're going to read a few of them and talk about some stuff next when we finish the story. Enjoy the commercials. Any runner will tell you about a second wind 
when they don't think they have any more gas in the tank and they have to stop and catch their breath. They can't go any further, but then suddenly they get this burst of energy to keep pushing. John Goodwin met some runners who get their energy from kids who can't afford for them to stop. I would love to be playing basketball or playing football, but you know, running is, is what I can do now, and I think that I've definitely it's grown on me. Pounding the pavement is something Evan Altorfer is learning to love. When you get tired and you want to quit and you think about the kids who don't have an option to quit. The reason why he's running, now that comes easy. If a cure comes out of any of these dollars, that's a lasting impact that's well worth the effort. Evan is one of 20 runners that will stride towards something bigger on Saturday. The Sam Day Buddy Run will take off at Dornbecker Hospital and after 12 miles wind up here at Terra Linda Park. Every runner is running in honor of a particular kid and the funding that they bring in will go to research. As of right now, I will end chemo in exactly 12 days. <laughs> so I'm super excited about that. Anna Grace Pelson from Grants Pass is one of those kids. The hardest part was probably losing my hair. Yeah, this is actually a wig, but it looks pretty good. <laughs> There's strength in her smile and sense of humor. Anna Grace was diagnosed with osteosarcoma in February. And they removed nine inches of bone, and here's my scar. <laughs> and in place of that is a metal prosthesis. Her prognosis is good. Surgeons were able to remove all our cancer. So we want to be able to say we're working on it. Lorna Day supports kids like Anna Grace. She's the executive director of the Sam Day Foundation, but more importantly, Sam's mom. The parenting books would have, would have called him spirited. When he was nine, Sam was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma. A tumor found in his left leg forced an amputation below the knee, and a year later, part of his right foot, followed by another year of hard treatment and more tough news was all clear for just a couple of months, then developed um, tumors in his lungs. And those never went away. Sam passed away at 15, a week before he was supposed to start high school. Sam taught us to dream big, laugh often, and live well. Every day that you have hope is 100 times more tolerable than a day without hope. So far, the Buddy Run has raised $40,000, and everyone involved willing to go that extra mile. To see the way that the Day family really rallied around Sam and has committed to making positive impact um, is something I wanted to be a part of. Yeah, this has definitely changed me, and I want to be able to give back to all the people who have helped me throughout uh, my treatment and just my whole experience. I have a hard story, but I'm chronically hopeful, and um, we want Sam Day Foundation to be uh, a place where families feel like it generates some hope for, for what they're going through as well. In Portland, John Goodwin, KGW News. All right, Sue wrote in wondering about fire victims and said, where can I donate items like towels and linens and dog food and pet accessories directly to families who have suffered losses in these fires? So everything is going to vary greatly from community to community. Um, for the most part, what I've been hearing from different uh, law enforcement and uh, cities is the the money is the best thing to do so if you if you are in the if you have the opportunity to give money do that but aside from that I would go ahead and contact my local fire department look for for areas like that where people might might have a need um, Pam Corey wrote it and said given your story this evening talking about homelessness um, on, on homeless housing what is the status of Wapato jail so um, I wasn't sure I asked my producer who told me during that story that was running that Wapato jail is going to open as a homeless shelter on October 2nd. We've done a ton of coverage on this, so you can look it up on our YouTube channel or just Google KGW Wapato Jail coverage and, and see what we've discussed. I mean, there's been, a, it's, man, it's been a saga, but we will, of course, um, keep up with it and tell you what happens. October 2nd, it's supposed to open, and we'll see what kind of help it, it provides. Thanks for being with us tonight. Keep those questions coming. I'm Dan Haggerty. This is the story. We'll see you back in more.